Last time on Kakume, Vegeta finally earned the trust of Sadala Saiyans. Bulma cozied up to a Saiyan who has a tuffle husband and a hybrid son. And as luck would have it, said husband also has a high enough rank to get him both into the Saiyan Tuffle Laboratories, so Bulma will be able to improve the technology here any way she can. In Universe 9, our human fighters fought and lost bat against the trio did injure. We're also where Ro and Sidra appear to be planning a possible betrayal in the pending inter-universal war, even blatantly hiding their scheme from Mojito. Today, we rejoin Seventeen, Boo, Gohan, and others as we continue to move towards the impending chaos. <laughs> This is part 14 of an ongoing series which was created by Darkos, Poison Labo, and Rinko. Support them and catch up fully using the links below. A month after, Krillin and the others began their training with the warriors of Universe 9. We bring ourselves back to the Universe 7 Earth. Specifically, Krillin and 18's house. Still in ruins from Goku and Beerus' immense battle. Paparoni. Again, the Universe 3 fighter who controlled all the team's artificial life forms in the tournament. Explains with heavy pride that Shinbot is very useful to travel between universes. But he does admit that he still needs to work out a few problems with it. For example, you have to wait a month between uses, so it's not exactly practical in every situation. Worth noting, Shinbot is the name of the DNA-based robot from Universe 3 that uses the Supreme Kai's genetics as a reference for its abilities. However, given he's already been on Earth for 30 days now, he's already lost enough time in achieving what he set out to do in the first place. And since the robot is all charged up, the cyborg twins figure it's time to go. Excited. 18 offers an anxious stress as she spouts she's ready. She owes it to her husband, for the sake of their families. They all need to get back on track with their own preparation for what's to come. Kneeling down to bid goodbye to his kids, 17 tells them that he'll be back soon, and they need to take care of their mother while he's gone. His sister comments something similar to her own child. Smiling to Marin to help out her aunt, and she's counting on her. As Sapphire and Pearl wave their respective parents off, their mother, who probably also has a name, warns her husband to be careful, who shoots her a Goku pose and promises to do so. So is Shimba finally ready? They just need to enter the coordinates and the trip will be almost instantaneous. But we seem to have a little bit of unfinished business here. With a familiar gruffiness, Mr. Satan nervously calls out to the gang. Greeting him, he reveals that they've come to Paparoni at the request of the mayor. The only electronic devices still working at the town hall burned out, and this happened only after indicating the position of Krillin's house. Here, for a brief second. Has the war started? Or is this some kind of false alarm? The scientist quells his worries that the war definitely hasn't started. They're simply preparing for a journey to his own native world. They just now activated his Shinbot, which must have disrupted the magnetic network. Apologizing for the inconvenience, he bequesters who this mustache gentleman is. But who is he? He's only the strongest man in the world. With a smirk, Paparoni regrets to inform him that if he is indeed the strongest, he doesn't remember seeing him in the Tournament of Power. This only prompts the warrior who famously rid the planet from the likes of Cell to scoff at the visitor's arrogance. He is the great Mr. Satan, world-renowned for his extraordinary martial arts skills. And suddenly, it's like his left hand hit a brick wall. Sapphire snatches his... Is it a Sapphire or sa Sapphire? That's Sapphire. Sweet. Sapphire snatches his fist, hissing that the fatty get out of the way. He almost hit their sister. The child's mother walks over to tell her kin not to be so rude. And for different reasons than myself. Her presence causes Hercules' eyes to bulge out of his head. Stuttering, he exclaims she's Crystal, the supermodel star. And that's right. She smiles and replies that she already understands that he's Mr. Satan, world champion of martial arts. Causing his eyes to spontaneously morph into horrific sclera solitary fibrous tumors. Gushing at the fact that she of all people would actually know who he is. Although... Paparoni asked a question how famous this guy actually is to be acting in such a manner, which 18 doesn't even want to begin to get into. As this nonsensory goes on, Boo finds himself fixated on a particular object. Inspecting the Shimba while everybody's distracted. He angrily steams. What is this thingy? And he swallows a hole! Bit, bit, bop, bit, bop, bop. 
dashing over as fast as she can to try to stop what's happening. Eighteen frantically wonders why this guy has to always show up at the worst possible time. But unable to help. Both Shemba and Boo disappear in the flash of light. Shouting out to Paparoni, she questions where they went. Showing defeat in his expression, the scientist details how Boo activated the robot without entering new coordinates. The fact that he teleported means the destination was chosen randomly when Shembot was in his mouth, meaning it'll be impossible to find either of them. Though 18 argues that there was a location selected before, right? Why wouldn't it just send him there? And the truth is, there was a location selected, but it was just here in Universe 7. The problem is that if Shimbot is gone, it's because the location was changed while Boo was eating it, as he just explained. With a sigh, Seventeen groans that he knew all of this would eventually amount to nothing. And of course, Mr. Satan doesn't understand a thing of what's going on. This pizza guy's magic tricks are cool and all, but where's Majin Boo? While unknown to them, he has arrived in none other than the Demon Realm. In Universe 11, we rejoin Gohan in his mission with the Pride Troopers, while trying to steal a virus which was developed to be sold to the highest bidder. One of the bad guys bellows that there's no way our hero's getting out of here with that bottle, commanding him to put it down in his hands up. Tossing it into the air. He had wished he could do this without hurting anyone, but they've left him no choice. Gohan handles his adversaries with ease. Jiren and Dispo ready themselves to move in. They're going to go through the same window Gohan used to gain access to the facility. Spotting the Saiyan, Dispo inquires why Gohan didn't answer them when they were trying to contact him. Shooting the pair a smile and thumbs up, it looks like he was able to catch the container in time. He apologizes for the concern, but it got a little hectic leaving the rabbit to then question why he came all the way down here. Unsure what he means. The troop refers to why didn't he just use the same window as he did to initially get in here. He probably could have avoided a lot of this chaos. And now that he mentions it, that's a pretty good point. Moments later, the villains are seen being escorted to a paddy wagon by the local army. Likely a simple alternative to having a police force in this world. One of the guards of the building shouts for him to wait. He's a soldier too. He works for the government. But alas, his cries fall on deaf ears. Jiren compliments Gohan. He caused more fear than harm and managed to succeed in his mission. When he's approached by the rest of the troopers, led by Casserole, showing a degree of satisfaction, he admits the young man has done his duty. Moreover, Jiren and Dispo have praised his merits and bravery. He had indeed already proven himself at the Tournament of Power but he has now confirmed their expectations by yet again proving his ability to serve the innocent. In short, all of this talk amounts to swearing him in as their newest brother. As of tonight, Sun Gohan is the 56th member of the Pride Troopers. After this accomplishment, the Pride Troopers headed off to a fancy restaurant to celebrate. Kasserol hicks out his congrats to the Saiyan, and although likely somewhat ethanol influenced, he proclaims that he doesn't know him well enough yet, but he already loves him. Zori calls out for the general to calm down. He's coming on a little strong. Laughing along with the group, Kokadi assures Gohan not to mind him. He's always like this. Who's fine with all the attention? After all, you need to decompress after a mission. But referencing the general's mental state, Dispo quips that it isn't Kasserol who went on the mission. Detracting, the former asks Gohan to tell everyone a little more about his family. They all know his father, but that's about it. Who explains how he has a younger brother named Goten and his mother Chi Chi. She's an exemplary mother who always wanted him and his brother to succeed, and he loves her very much. And then there's his wife Fidel and daughter Pan. But he has a daughter? Dispo congratulates him on this. 
She must be adorable. Does he have a picture? And he does, opening his wallet to show an image of the three of them. Rabbit is awestruck by the scene, before reaching into his jacket pocket to show him a picture of his own. He too is a dad. Although, his litter appears a lot more of a handful than Gohan's. Chuckling, the Saiyan sarcastically chortles that he has a small family. Returning the look, Dispo tells how this is just the latest litter. He's very proud of him. But uh, he means there are other litters? As Kettle alerts everyone that someone has just arrived. Seen better in much worse days. It's Belmod, top following behind. The former destroyer tells how he crossed paths with death, but the current between he and the Reaper wasn't strong enough. So he decided to return. Meanwhile, on Planet Crepe, still trying to sink their key and complete their first bit of training. The one where they have to hit the ball at the same time. Trunks feels at a loss. There seems to be nothing they can do. It looks like the only lead that they have is to rely on the weird door Goten saw on his head. This might be the only way for them to succeed, but he too needs to see it. Goten reassures his friend that he can do it. If he himself can, there's no reason he can. Closing his eyes, he figures he doesn't have much of a choice. Concentrating. And finding himself in the same realm as Goten did. The boy looks around asking if it worked. As Goten calls out to him, they realize they can hear each other, but not see each other. Either way, Trunks tells him that he can see the door now. He thinks they should open it. Without much more in this place, that is likely the only thing they can do. But as Goku's youngest son approaches it, he sees something in the reflection. It's Gotenks? His opposite sees the same. It's pretty strange. He does everything Goten himself is doing. Same with Trunks. When for a split second, the boys see each other instead of the fused warrior. So maybe. Goten shouts on the count of three for Trunks to raise his right hand and spread his fingers. Counting. The pair see each other plain as day. When the door opens to reveal Gotenks. But weren't they supposed to face their demons behind this door? That's what we said at least. But this explains everything. Their demons, or rather demon, is him. Which, duh, but better explained. With fusion, there's no need to calibrate and sync with each other. Everything is automatic once they become a single being. So they're gonna have to read each other without relying on fusion to do so. With the game plan set, it's now or never. Finishing with perfect sync. That was too easy. The boys chuckle that Whis is gonna have to train him harder next time. Though their hubris precedes them, their attitude puts the angel at ease. When something catches his focus, after several millennia, Lord Beerus has finally decided to return. But to where is he returning? On the destroyer's planet, the Oracle Fish states that Whis is left with the two Saiyan children. So now it's Beerus' turn to leave as well? He can't leave them all alone. What's he going to do here by himself? And that's simple. He just has to go to Earth. There's plenty of good things to eat there. But the Anguilliformis wonders why he can't just tag along with the Destroyer. But it's because where Beerus is going is no place for him. Causing the Elipomorpha, or at least Eumetozoa, to refute that the journey will be long and the Felis Caddis will need company. To which the Felidae wistfully replies, with this war approaching, the only company he needs is that of the perpetuity of silence. So he will be going alone, and that is his final decision. As he dons an unfamiliar garb, the Oracle Fish mentions that Beerus only wears that outfit on very rare occasions. Who reveals that he only wears it when he goes home. 
vowing to his father that he'll be back soon. Entering his native world. He's missed this feeling. Planet Gezi. He makes his approach to someone else who beat him here. Rhetorically asking if he decided to come too. Champa. He scoffs that he's been waiting for Beerus for like a month now. And if we look at the formation of stones in front of him, it reads pair, or rather, dad. Beerus comments to his father that he hasn't been here in over a thousand years. When Shampa questions how he might have acted, had he found himself in the same situation as they. This whole thing is one giant headache. His brother smirks that he's sure his dad would do a whole lot better than Champa at least. Who lovingly tells his sibling to speak for himself. Back with the boys, as Goten begins to wake up, confused, he asks Whis if they made it. Already conscious, Trunks is happy to see his friends slept well. The angel reveals that they will now enter the second stage of their training. They must now unlock their godly potential. It's a necessary step to reach stage three of their preparation. But God Key, if this is step two, what on earth could be included in step three? Their mentor simply wishes them luck. Before welcoming them to Planet Lestia, here are two spheres of God Key. The only advice Whis has for them, they must assimilate them. But that's all? The kids laugh that he has to be kidding. Shutting his eyes, their teacher informs that is the very case. Assimilate an orb apiece. After they manage to do so, the step will be completed. While both spheres slowly make their way towards the kids, they feel they're going way too slow. So they charge after them. And after the energy merges with the duo, it's strange but not unbearable. When their Genkai spirit orbed by the key, Whis chuckles that perhaps he should have warned them. Apart from their fathers, no mortal has ever survived these spheres, and this is accounting for millions of years of trying. It's a miracle that both of them are still conscious. Writhing in pain, Goten grunts what this thing is. What are they supposed to do? But Trunks has a different reaction. Screeching, he will become stronger than his father. Trying to hold on and cursing through the agony. But the pair collapse and the energy leaves their bodies, causing their mentor to wonder if he overestimated them. Although, it's not like these fears were even fully charged. With his face in the water, Goten questions if when we said assimilate, he means they have to keep these orbs inside themselves. Which is exactly what he means. In other words, all of that pain just now was for nothing. But Trunks rests on his resolve that he will surpass his dad, no matter what! Who, at the same time, meditates in Universe 6 on Sadala. The training here intensifies as well. The Saiyans face the fields of action and the limits of their potential. Hill and Broly seem to still be focused on helping the latter better control himself. She tells the giant he's almost there while the others also discover unexpected aptitude. When? The group receives an unexpected and unfortunate visitor. Spotting the king, who has already warned them against using their Super Saiyan forms for reasons unknown. Vegeta tells everyone to keep going. He'll be back. with the ruler face to face. He utters to the royal that he's seen him coming more and more to see the Saiyans exercise. But naturally, his next step should be to participate in the training. However, the king throws him a curveball, demanding that he and his friends leave this planet at dawn. But what? Is he joking or just foolish? Narrowing his glare, Vegito was warned, summoning his guards. Though the guards are easy work, the king seems to stop Vegeta's fist with only his mind. Our prince pleads he listen. After 
after socking him in the face. The royal stares into Vegeta's soul, hissing that to think. This man taught his people to defend themselves. Vegeta and his allies are nothing but traitors to the Saiyan race. But what on earth could Sadala have against the Super Saiyan form? Broly sees what's going on, but only wonders what Vegeta will do. And not too surprisingly, the Saiyan only smiles at this. So here is the true face of the pacifist king. Although he is much stronger than he thought. Get in the key barrier! Quick! Why didn't you even bother to show up in the tournaments against us? You could have protected your own! Ow. Just as the Universe 7 warrior thinks he's going to throw a left, he launches a flying knee instead. But manages to get him with his right hand. Never have I encountered such an affront from a Saiyan! You will leave this planet by force! This is interesting, but you keep holding back your true abilities! Vegeta moves in after changing to Super Saiyan. The king drops his guard to only shield his eyes. But why? He finally demands that it's time for him to explain. What makes him hate this form so much, even though it's only a multiplier of power? Stala remains silent, covering his face. While well, speculation begins to break out amongst the native Saiyans. One of the admirals shouts for everyone to get back to training. But Kappa can't help but wonder what Vegeta's trying to do. Better late than never, King Sadala gives the reason for his hatred. He explains that this demonic form with the golden hair took over his own body for the first time, the same night Gherkin took the life of the previous king. Remember, Gherkin was the evildoer that the current Sadala defeated to take the throne. But along with this form, this golden evil, it took away hundreds of innocent lives along with the lives of his enemies. Women, children, brothers in arms, the overwhelming power caused by the transformation amplified his hatred into an endless rampage. The image of a child carrying a sister's body within the flames still haunts him to this day. That form is only the manifestation of evil. A form only attainable under such hatred cannot be healthy and will end up driving its user into madness. Prompting Vegeta to shout that Kaba has achieved the very same transformation, but through the devotion to protect none other than Sadala himself. Would an evil, hate-driven demon really team up with the king just to protect him? But he's not persuaded. Believing one cannot be sure who's truly one's own people. Not once even the devout admit they are nothing more than a desperate, starving man. Now growing frustrated, Vegeta wants to know who exactly the king thinks he's dealing with. What makes them who they are can't be reduced to a singular analogy, or in the literal sense, a singular physical form. It's nonsense to judge someone based on anything besides their actions. But all too often, the actions they're least proud of stick out the most. Any way you look at it though, the Super Saiyan form is just a weapon like any other. The key is to use it wisely. However, the heavy burden Vegeta just displayed in his eyes isn't lost on the king. The look of regret from the bottom of his soul. With a slight pause, he admits that in the past, he massacred entire civilizations for nothing more than pleasure. Leading Sadala back to his point, what did he just tell him? This demonic form made him crazy. But what he doesn't know is that the Super Saiyan was a mere legend at the time. He didn't even really believe it existed. He was in his normal state, 
and more or less sound mind upon committing these slaughters. Though now all is well for himself, and today it's up to Sadala himself to rid himself from the burden he carries. Possibly getting through. The king has yet another question. Kaba has told him a lot about Vegeta. He said he was a man who loved his people. So what made him change and become aware of his horrific actions? Who actually snickers a bit at this? Gazing upwards, he would like to tell him that it's only because his wife and children, but the truth is that he owes it to his encounter with a warrior who is greater than himself. A few years ago, he understood where true happiness and true justice resided. The Earth, the planet he attacked, his planet. It became Vegeta's home too, where he started a family. Without the son named Warrior, he wouldn't be the same as he is today. And it's precisely because of these transformations, and each time his rival surpassed himself, that caused him to admire him more and more, in spite of his own pride. The Super Saiyan form opened his eyes to what is right, opened his eyes to this friend. He continues. He states Sadala fell to his knees not knowing how to get up, but he himself understands. He too would have probably acted even less wise had he been in his place. Remembering back to his brothers lost due to his rampage, King Sadala decides that it's time to finally say goodbye. As Sadala Saiyans belt out in celebration, the royal would look down upon his people, those cheering and laughing. It wasn't until now that the king understood the true value of what's in front of him. Meanwhile, in Universe 7 on Earth, Fidel coaches her dad, calling out that he's almost there. Everyone participating in the war has to find their own way. Even the weakest are making their contribution to the cause. As so much as the likes of Mr. Satan begins to learn key use, will they really be ready in time? But with the motivation and stakes never higher, what choice did they have? Though things are beginning to rumble in Universe 14. And Universe Zero. Our heroes are about to face a threat they can't yet even imagine.